Hello, everyone, and welcome to So Very Wrong About Games. I'm your co-host, Mark Bigney, and with me, as always, is my good friend, the loyal co-host, Michael Walker. How are you doing, Walker? Fantastic. Glad to hear that, Walker, because I've decided that in the new year, Happy New Year, everyone, that we're going to completely change things up. We're no longer going to be doing what we did all of last year because that's a tired, old, staid format. This year, we're going to be talking about board games. That's crazy. What am I going to do with all these props? First off, before we get started in earnest, we'd like to issue a mild correction from last year. Walker made the astute observation that in over the course of 2018, only two games had reached the top 200. We omitted to mention, as always, the bugbear that people have been harassing me about what, for what seems like all year, namely Brass Birmingham, which itself is arguably a new design from 2018 that managed to find its way into, into the BGG top 200. I'd just like to stress once again, once more for the cheap seats, If I get a chance to play it, maybe I'll play it. But we're not going to seek it out because we have good reasons. I don't like Brass. Walker doesn't like Wallace Economic Games. Enough said. We're going to try to move on, although I'm sure you loyal listeners will not let us. I'll try to play it. Unfortunately, the one copy we had in town has moved away, but there has been interest to pick up another copy. So we'll see. Yeah, it went traveling all by itself. It was the strangest thing. <laughs> Wallace games have so many redundant rules that they actually became self-aware and took the Birkenhead connection all the way. They became sentient and, yeah. and fled into the night. We're doomed. So let's begin with our as-yet-unnamed retrospective intro segment, namely the Eurus. Uh, one reviewer recommended that we call it the First Anniversary Reviews Revisited, or FAR, F-A-R-R. I'm not sure. I like the as-yet-unnamed review intro segment. And that was last year. Scythe of the Wind Gambit was actually what we talked about, but more, mostly Scythe in the context of all its expansions. Yeah, when I looked this up, it just made me angry because it made me think of, you know, Fenris that we have yet to finish from last year. So, yeah, just this just brought anger. It is disappointing. Have your thoughts about the Wind Gambit evolved at all? No, nope, not at all. It's it's still, I think it's a fantastic expansion. I don't think I played Scythe once without it. Unless, you know, the expansion said, unless this new Fenris expansion said not to play with it. That was the only times I have not played with it. I think it adds an interesting dimension, a way to move around the board differently and a way to change it up. I stand by my previous analysis. I really like Invaders from Afar. I think the Wind Gambit is just a little too ancillary, a little bit too detached, a little bit of unnecessary cruft. But I'll play with it. It's not like I'm going to refuse to play with it, but I, I don't find it ad- adds much to the game. Anyway, you can check our previous episode for that. But in our brand new format for 2019, we're going to have the following all new segments. We're going to talk about games we played over the past, well, few weeks now because we took some time off to abuse our family as well as our listeners. We're going to talk about the news and why it doesn't matter. Our feature game this week is going to be Pandemic Fall of Rome. And then our topic is going to be our New Year's resolutions for 2019. We're going to look back at the resolutions we made last year, comment on the progress or lack thereof, and make some new ones for the coming year. So, Walker. It's going to be fantastic. I, I personally can't wait. I, can't I have wait. chills. Chills, Walker. So right. what did you play last week? Last week, well, sometime in the last few weeks, I played a game called Telestrations. It's like a broken telephone drawing broken telephone. You get like a code name, word, or phrase, and you write it in your little book. And depending on how many players, you're either going to immediately draw a picture and pass it on, or you're just going to pass it on, and the next person just looks at your picture and tries to write what he thinks you tried to draw. And then he passes that on, and they look at his description only, not at your picture, and then you just keep passing around the whole circle until it comes back to you, and then you tell the story of your first key phrase and how it developed as it went around, and to see if it either A, even came close to the first word, or developed off on a totally different track. I thought it was hilarious and fun. Yeah, I played Telestrations a few years ago. It was, of the, you know, variation of party games, it was it was relatively amusing. But it was one of those things where I couldn't even begin to fathom how you were supposed to interpret these chicken scratchings. And I that's think, part of the game, of course. No, I thought it was fantastic. Some of them even, like, veered way off and then, like, slowly was, you know, at, like, the fifth or sixth, they were coming back somehow to the original thing and but never quite got there. But it was funny how it, you know, even somehow got towards the word again. I thought it was hilariously funny. So that's Telestrations. I played a game called Diamonds. This is a game that you talked about a few weeks ago that I didn't try, and I got a chance to try it. Diamonds is a trick-taking game with a couple of innovations, one of them being a take-that element, which is definitely not something I would have thought that trick-taking needs. And after having played Diamonds, I can confirm that I don't think it does much justice to the trick-taking format. I didn't think that arbitrary screwage to other players at the table and stealing their points on... furthermore, very limited information, does the format any justice. 
It also seems to really lean into some of Trick Taking's problems, namely the inherent variability in, in opening hands. Some suits in diamonds just plain seem better than the other suits. And this isn't even in the sense that, oh, well, you know, someone's going to declare Trump or what have you. It just seems like the eponymous diamonds are the better suit to have, and you would rather have a fistful of diamonds than anything else. I thought it was okay. It didn't overstay its welcome, which a lot of trick-taking games do. I felt that it was reasonably snappy, but honestly, I never really felt like I had much control over my fate, even by the standards of trick-taking. You could do worse in the trick-taking genre. It's, it's, it's perfectly inoffensive, but I definitely prefer some of the classics, like Bargain Hunter is probably still my favorite. I'd probably even prefer Wizard, although argue, arguably Wizard is far, far, far too long for what it is. But Diamonds, I think, you know, the overall, the innovations were blunted by the, the sort of randomness and the arbitrary take thatness of it all. And I never really felt like I, I had much control over my destiny. So that was Diamonds. I feel as though it's a game that you can really rope in, you know, like bridge players or euchre players, right, without, you know, too much fanfare. You know what I mean? Where if you show them something like Bargain Hunters or some sort of fantasy, fantasy theme, you're going to lose them right off the bat. Where with Diamonds, it's something that they're, you know, easily going to adapt into, I think. I definitely agree that that's true of a lot of the sort of hobbyist trick-taking games. I think of things like Mu or things like that, which have incredibly Baroque bidding rules. Now, granted, that might be of appeal to bridge players. Depends on the bridge player. But I don't think that some of the less obtuse trick-taking games... Bargain Hunter is very, very straightforward. What I like about Bargain Hunter is that it's dynamic and what you're looking for changes from round to round. And this was one of Uwe Rosenberg's games before he designed Agricola. And I think that it's it's aged much better than Bonanza in particular. But I'm just not a huge fan of Bonanza. I mean, look, as I say, there's nothing particularly wrong with diamonds. I just don't like games in general where there's targeted screwage where you don't have a good sense of who's winning. And... It's not even a strategy that you can pursue. Diamonds is a game where you're forced to deploy these powers on a regular basis based on what you've been dealt in your hand, which kind of feeds into my other critique about not really having much control over your destiny. I didn't strongly dislike it. It's just there are many, many trick-taking games that I'd strongly prefer. There's one called Nyet that is really interesting as well. There's like a whole board of rules and you get to actually like bid on what the rules for this particular round are going to be. I think that's fantastic. The Mu and Lots More package that was put out by Rio Grande uh, over a decade ago is probably the best value for money in terms of trick-taking games, definitely. Vashtikt by, uh, uh, by Karl Heinz Schmiel is probably my favorite trick-taking game, although it's relatively obtuse. It has this bizarre deduction element before the hand begins where everyone has to deduce what the, what the trump is and what the super trump is, and then you make a bid about what tricks you want to win, but the bids, are, uh, the, the bids aren't just the number of tricks you're going to win, but there are specific cards, like I'm going to win two tricks, or I'm going to win no tricks, or what have you. Anyway, I really like Vashtikt if you're looking for the more obtuse stuff. For the more simple stuff, I'd rather play something like Nyet, or something like Bargain Hunter. But as I say, Diamonds is relatively inoffensive. All right, moving on, I played a fantastic game called Meltwater. And if you play two-player games a lot, then this is a game that you have to try. This is like an abstract two-player strategy game where you're moving Americans against Russians on the Antarctic Circle because, you know, the rest of the world's been wiped out. Everyone's had to, you know, rush up to to the North Pole. And they're, everyone's starving. So there is, there's two sides to this game, which apparently the designer wanted to be in this game because, because essentially what you are doing are you letting people starve or you're, you're forcing people into your community because you're the only one that can feed them. But it's a very interesting way to maneuver around the map, force people off the map, you know, bring – force the way people either A, have to move or how the game mechanics push people into your units. I thought it was a fantastic game. So I think there are two buckets of things that could be said about Meltwater. I'll just note that the subtitle is A Game of Tactical Starvation, which I think captures it relatively well. So there's the element of it just purely as a mechanical experience. And there, actually, I'd like to play it another couple times before I comment on it. My, my initial responses are very much aligned with yours, that it's clever, that it's very sort of minimal luck. It's about being able to foresee the consequences of a relatively focused group of actions to do to sort of manipulate the board and how things are going to move. That's one part of it. The second part of it is Meltwater. And I realize that I'm going to sound even more pretentious than I normally do when talking about this. I sincerely apologize. I'm aware of it. It's nothing I can do. It's a disease, really. Meltwater as a sort of artistic statement. On her Twitter feed, the designer, Erin Lee Escobedo, says, come play my sad game. And I think that that's a good way to characterize it because when playing Meltwater, 
it really started making me think of some of my favorite video games that are not fun. I'm thinking specifically about a game called Spec Ops The Line. Spec Ops The Line was a third-person shooter game that was really trying to be a critique of third-person shooter games in very many ways. It was sort of a take on Heart of Darkness, and and it was just – it was a game that tried to make you feel bad. It was a game that tried to make you feel bad about yourself in a lot of ways. And the fact that it was successful says a lot about it as a statement of art. And I think that Meltwater does the same thing. I was playing Meltwater, and first of all, right off the bat, when you set up Meltwater, it's clear that there's plenty of land for both groups to coexist. But the game tells you you shouldn't. Sorry, not even the game tells you you shouldn't. Your own impulses as a gamer make you feel that you shouldn't, Yeah. right? Why should I let the Soviets eat? (laughs) Why should I let them survive? Yeah, that's right. I'm blue, they're red. So, you know, that's not allowed. Just so. And so that's the first bit of strange cognitive dissonance that the game game puts you in. And the game makes you feel mean in a way that others don't. I just talked about diamonds and I I dinged it for forcing you to engage and take that mechanisms. I never felt especially mean when playing diamonds. I felt mean when playing Meltwater. When starving a group of refugees, either deliberately or accidentally, when press ganging a bunch of Soviets for joining me just because I had a sandwich and they didn't, I felt cruel. I felt bad about myself for doing these things. I didn't feel bad for anything I was doing to you as the opponent. I just felt bad in general. As a person. (laughs) As a person. Seriously. And that is part, I sincerely think, was part of the design intent of Meltwater and the fact that it pulls it off is truly epic making, I think, in a lot of ways, because uh, the the designer in her designer notes talks about a a, a relatively famous game called Train, which is about a a reasonably straightforward pick game, and then you discover you're sending people to Auschwitz. And the setup for Train always seemed to me a bit cheap, a little bit of sleight of hand. You know, getting you to get buy-in on a purely mechanical level and then pulling the rug out from under you and saying, ah, you've been doing this terrible thing. Whereas in Meltwater, you know full well from the start what you're doing and why. And so you get the players to buy in. And then a couple turns later, they look back and realize that they've become a monster. And that's the kind of artistic expression that I find so gripping about Meltwater. Meltwater was put up by a very, very small press uh, called Hollenspiel. This is the first Hollenspiel title that I've ever tried. And it's really, really impressive, both mechanically and in terms of this thematic evocation. The next game that I'm going to be trying from them is a game called This Guilty Land, which is about the politics surrounding slavery in the U.S., also designed in part to make you feel uncomfortable. I was going to say, they really take on the light topics, these guys. Well, historical wargaming often brushes over or ignores these kinds of things. And so the fact that Hollenspiel has a number of designs that really line into it make me fascinated. Anyway, Meltwater fascinates me on all manner of levels. I really think that it is uh, a, a very significant achievement in game design. And I look forward to exploring it more, both mechanically and artistically. Agreed. But yet, unfortunately, it falls into that it's only a two-player game and it's, it's slightly uh, front-end heavy. So I'm hoping we're going to get it to the table more often. One of the one of the great things about Meltwater is those tactical mistakes help reinforce that second part that I was talking about. It is an experience. It is a, a, a method of exploiting cognitive dissonance and making making you evoke feelings, which is, to a certain extent, the defining element of what an artistic statement ought to do. Anyhow, uh, I don't want to go too far on the deep end about the aesthetics of this, but uh, Meltwater, I think, I think I I'm starting to get what the designer was trying to accomplish, and I'm thoroughly impressed at her vision and her execution of. It. So I'm very much looking forward to exploring Meltwater and also more of what Hollenspiel has to offer. Another game we played was Tokyo Highway, a much less ambitious game. Tokyo Highway is sort of a dexterity placement game where there's no board and you're trying to build a very, very strange kind of series of highways that all overlap and go under each other. I have to say, as a native Montrealer, the highway systems that you create don't look quite as crazy to me as they might to other people. I've I've enjoyed my time with Tokyo Highway. It's very, very visually stunning. I think it's missing a couple of rules. It's a little wonky in terms of what happens when pieces fall off. Uh, I'm, I'm considering a number of house rules to maybe make it a little bit more functional, but maybe I'm trying to make turn it into something that it's not. Anyhow, visually delightful, not 100% sold on how all the gameplay elements come together, but it's yeah. certainly quick and cheerful. So. Yeah, essentially you're putting out these uh, 
uh, co- concrete columns, and you're putting down these popsicle sticks that create the highway. And if you you have to keep your highway separate from everybody else's, and then when you either cross over top or underneath someone else's highway, then you essentially score a point, and you have so many points in front of you. And when you get rid of them all, you win the game. And I think it's a fantastic game. It's like a little bit of strategy and dexterity all mixed together, and I think it, they pulled it off fairly well. There, it comes with little plastic tweezers, and at the beginning of the game, Walker looked at the tweezers and said, "I'm not going to use those. That that that, yeah. that that's for sookie babies." Two turns in, he was using them. So I think like it goes- it's awfully tight. You know, when you have these giant mandible fingers, it's hard to get into these. You know, when you get all these highways all crisscrossing across each other, I can see why they added them for sure. Look, I told you not to get your surgery from a back alley crab fisherman. It's your own fault. It's so true. So that was Tokyo Highway. The next game I'm going to talk about is Robotech, Attack on the SDF-1. How long we got? Well, it is a co-op game. I'm going to start off by saying that if you enjoy anything to do with Macross or Robotech, that you will love this game. If you've never watched it or know nothing about it, then I would avoid this game. It doesn't really bring very much extra to the table. And it has a whole bunch of extra stuff that doesn't need to be there. It has like several decks that could have been, you know designed down into nothing and a whole bunch of story elements that don't really go anywhere. But essentially, it is still a really fun game. And if you have any interest in anime or that, you know, giant robot genre, like I wasn't a big Macross or Robotech person, but just because I I, I enjoy that genre of giant robots and anime, I still found it extremely fun and still interesting. I am a huge Macross fan. And I have to say that the people that I've played this game with were very, very, very tolerant of number one, my going into excruciating detail about the the, the, the the backdrop and the settings for all the different episodes, and number two, my insistence on using the original Japanese terms rather than the American ones. And that's just because that's what I'm more familiar with, and I think that some of the American terms sound a bit silly. I'm a bit of a snob about those things, shocking everyone, I'm sure. And I could go on for literally hours about the way that it integrates the theme, but I'll, I'll just focus on one thing because I agree very much with Walker that in terms of co-op games, Robotech Attack on the SDF-1 doesn't really add, bring much to the table. It's a relatively standard tower defense kind of thing where you're just surviving against waves of enemies and you have to triage various threats, et cetera, et cetera. We've done this a million times before. But in terms of thematic execution, I have to say that this is one of the better games that I've played in terms of executing its theme. And I'll just stress one point to, to really bring that home. Uh, the game comes with three scenarios, which doesn't sound like a whole heck of a lot. But each scenario is broken down into episodes. And this isn't just a turn of phrase. It is literally the case that each round of the game is meant to evoke a specific episode in order from the show. Either the first sequence of Robotech or actual SDF Macross, depending on whether you have the American or Japanese versions. And it does a really good job, for the most part, of copying the beats of what happened. Now, of course, the, some, sometimes events happen out of order. Uh, sometimes Hayao Kekazaki dies at a different time or, or, or whatever. I'm sorry, spoilers. It's a, it's a 30-year-old show. I, I, I think I'm allowed to say what I want. You're clear. Yeah, thank you very much. And... Some of the details are changed because they have to be changed. Like, for example, there's a two-episode arc where several of the characters are just off doing weird stuff by themselves. And the game mostly hangs Swimsuit. Out, the, sims, the swimsuit uh, No, no. that No, they, they get captured and they go, <laughs> go to a different ship. But, and the game mostly glosses over that. But other than that, I, I have to say that in terms of, of executing its theme, it does a shockingly good job. It's Robotech Attack on the SDF-1 is longer than it needs to be. It's a solid two hours. The quality of decision-making is not excellent. But you do get to transform giant robots, and that's not nothing. And it is a giant robot on the table. So You do get to put a giant robot on the table. The components are very nice in that sense. And as, as, a, as a big fan of the setting, I enjoyed the game a fair bit. If, as exactly as Walker said, if you don't have any enthusiasm for the setting, I would encourage you to stay far, far away. Well, there is one interesting – I don't want to gloss over that brings nothing. It does have one interesting game mechanism where – in Macross, they sort of, uh, you know, brought in this whole part of the town. Like this, the spaceship crashed and, they're, you know, Earth decided they're going to rebuild this alien ship. And so this whole community built around this ship, this whole city develops in order to, you know, bring this ship back to life. And when, it, when the show starts up, 
it gets incorporated into the giant robot. And depending on how you do, these the population is going to give you more actions. And the way they divided the way you divide up the actions between the characters I thought was very interesting in the way you got more population. That particular one mechanism I thought was pretty good. I am so proud of myself that you were the one that got into the weeds of the plot details, <laughs> and I didn't. I deserve a medal. There you go. So that's a Robotech attack on the SDF-1. I got to play the Great Western Trail expansion, Rails to the North. Walker raved about this a few episodes ago, called it essential, and he said he was only going to be playing it that way going forward. And he, and he furthermore said that he would be including it for new players going forward as well. And I am not what you would call... A Great Western Trail expert or veteran. I've only played a, a small number of times. I enjoy it. I think it's uh, I, I think it's a fun game. Fister and I don't get along terribly well, but I would disagree with the characterization that, that Rails to the North is a good expansion for newcomers. The rules overhead is relatively minimal indeed, but the problem is. In terms of complicating the decision space, Rails to the North complicates things rather significantly. The most straightforward strategies, the ones that are the most obvious, uh, namely just bringing a large herd to market and just popping along other cities, which you can pursue successfully in the base game, uh, will get you smacked around real hard. And as a result for new players, they have to take into, consul- uh, take into account this entire new subsystem of things in order to be competitive, and it subverts expectations. Now, for an experienced player, this is ideal. If you love Great Western Trail but are a little bit tired of just uh, bringing large herds, uh, l- l- good quality herds to Kansas City every round, then absolutely Rails to the North is definitely for you, and I can't recommend it highly enough. If you're a relatively casual player, and if and or if you did not have any fundamental problems with the sort of rhythm and tempo and focus of Great Western Trail, I'm not sure that this expansion is for you. And so I'm a, I'm a little bit more uh, mixed on the expansion than Walker is. But again, that's partially because I play a lot less of Great Western Trail. So that was my impression of Rails to the North. I like it because of, you know, I went over the score pad of your game and, and talk to the people that played in it. And I agree with everything you said. But the other thing I, what I saw was the fact that you can just sort of ignore the expansion as well and just – and you're not going to win. Don't give me that. Don't right. get me wrong there. You're not going to, you know, uh, push for the lead of the game. But you'll still be able to play the game as you usually did and sort of, you know, punch at parts of the expansion and slowly learn it. It's not as though it's all or nothing. And that's the part which I thought was a, a good a good part of it. You're absolutely right. You will not be drowning in rules that you can't understand. It's not intimidating in that sense. So, in, in, And especially in the sense of added rules grit to, uh, to adding to the decision space, the ratio is very good for Rails to the North. It's just that I think it's one of those things where it will further exacerbate an experience differential and it further complicates things, making it that successful strategies have to be a little bit more complicated and a little bit less focused. And this is actually a substance of criticism. One of the reasons why I've really liked Gugong of the sort of medium medium to heavyweight Euros of the past few months more than some of the alternatives. And one of the reasons why I kind of sort of prefer uh, Great Western Trail without Rails to the North is that they're a little more focused. The scoring isn't as obtuse or complicated or I get a few few points from this and a few points from this and a few points from this. And all things being equal, I prefer it when the scoring is a little bit more straightforward, a little bit more focused. I don't feel like I have to climb 17 different tracks in order to do well. That's one of the reasons why I wasn't a huge fan of Coimbra and why I prefer the, the, the slightly more uh, nuanced stuff. Like, for example, like a Canizia, where the scoring tends to be perhaps a little bit Baroque, but focused, even when it's Baroque, like in cases of Samurai. Anyhow, all of this to, to say is that it does change the, the game a fair deal, despite the fact that the rules overhead itself is relatively minimal, which at least makes it interesting. I'll give it that much. Sure, I think you can make it focused. I think I can compare it to Marco Polo, where if you analyze the board and see uh, a combination that you can hit, you know, on the expansion board where if you, you know, follow this path and you you hit this and you follow this particular strategy that it will get you a lot of points in that one particular focused way. But like you said, that would not be for someone who is new to the expansion for sure. That is entirely fa- fair. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a little Freudian slip. Yeah. yeah. All right. And that is Rails to the North. Last thing I want to talk about is another expansion. This is the expansion to Fards of Infinity. I mean, Shards of Infinity. It's called Relics of the Future. 
put out by Stoneblade Entertainment last year, a relatively thin deck of cards that's added to the market. So that's just more of the same. The major thing that it introduces in the expansion is it add, adds a little bit of character asymmetry. The moment you hit 10 mastery, which for those who haven't played uh, Shards of Infinity, means once you've spent a little, a couple times through your deck, you get to choose one of two cards that are unique to your character and then add that to your deck. And these cards are crazy bananas powerful, but they're all crazy bananas powerful, so it all shakes out at the end. And I do kind of like it when a game that is reasonably straightforward and reasonably quick, like Shards of Infinity, lets you have a little bit more flavor in terms of the different characters and lets you get something a little crazy to play around with. That, that, that does make the decision space a little bit more fun as far as I'm concerned. It also adds a couple of tweaks to the multiplayer rules. I like the tweaks to the four-player rules. It introduces a team variant, which I think works reasonably well. The three-player one, eh, I might have to experiment a little bit more. It's a little bit wonkier. It, it really changes the relative value of different strategies in the game. It makes offense much more valuable. It also makes a series of weird incentives for attacking champions as opposed to players. It feels like a mistake in the three-player game to ever devote any effort to knocking out champions. Well, not ever, but it, it, it definitely changes the parameters significantly. Anyhow, I've had a good time with it. I still enjoy Shards of Infinity for some quick pure deck building fun and relics of the future is definitely more of the same and it's cheap and cheerful so i haven't had a chance to try it yet but from what i've heard i'm just wondering if a game that already plays fairly quickly already does it really need to be sped up by adding you know super crazy powers to you know make it that much faster everyone gets super crazy powers so it doesn't always just accelerate things all right sounds good and on to a new segment for the new year and news so we're going to be bringing news to you every week things that happen in the gaming community and things that interest us. My first news segment is a game that I looked up called 2491 Planet Ship. And I started to read this this explanation of this game, and it says the world has expanded out. There's all these giant planet ships that float around, and it's like whole worlds on these planet ships. And then suddenly – Like the SDF-1 Macross. Sort of like even bigger, though. This is called Planet – planet ships. Okay. All right. So then all of these planet ships get a distress call from the mothership Alpha, which is the the first one ever, the biggest one. So they all, you know, rush to the rescue and this thing's on fire. You know, you have to <laughs> and you have to like it's it's in in distress and it's and it's crumbling and you have to save it. So so this is sounding great that it's going to be this co-op thing that you know you're going to be going on, you're going to be trying to, you know, either fix parts of the ship to make it last longer so you can get the people out or whatever. Join us next week for more story time with Michael Walker. But no, it's not. You're like competing with the other players to get more people off than they are. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> And you're, I'm, you're competing to disembark more yeah, people faster? Yeah, and I'm just like looking at the screen. I'm just going, really? This is this is where they're going to go with this? But, you know, who knows? Maybe it'll be good. That is 2491 Planet Ship from Mebo Games. Got a couple reprints that are coming up that are interesting. One of them is a reprint to one of my favorite games of all time, Successor's 3rd Edition. Phalanx is going to be putting out a new edition next year. This has been languishing on the GMT reprint list for a long time, and it's uh, started to command relatively high prices on the secondary market, and for good reason. Successor's 3rd Edition is one of the best multiplayer war games, I think, that has been put out in the past. Uh, I mean, really, it's, it's not even that recent. It's been a while. It's a four-player card driven game. I've tried Sword of Rome. Sword of Rome didn't do anything for me. The coin games, I, I, I'm on record, is not really liking. They're not particularly card driven anyway. But Successors is a fabulous, fabulous game of the, Di- the Wars of the Diadochi. And it's all for the good that it's coming back in print. So I'm looking forward to seeing more images of what they're going to do. Apparently the rules updates are going to be minimal, but they're going to include a five player version. It, I haven't played it in a long time. I haven't uh, managed to corral enough people in Kingston to get interested in it because, of course, it's a GMT game. So, of course, therefore, it must be terrible by their logic. So that's going to be uh, a reprint of successors. I don't know if they're going to call it a fourth edition or if they're just going to call it a reprint of the third edition. Who knows? Another weird bit of reprint is there's going to be an Age of Steam Deluxe Edition. And I mentioned this. This is another Wallace economic yeah, game. I was going to ask you before we started whether you're going to talk about this. This is going to be interesting. I, I thought it was interesting when I read about it. Well, here's what I find interesting about it. And I just want to flag this. I'm not going to be able to get into the weeds because the details could take several hours. No exaggeration. Uh, but the last time Age of Steam was published, it was published without any designer accreditation on the box. And that's because the rights to Age of Steam are under what you might charitably call dispute by several different parties. 
And Martin Wallace mostly has washed his hands of the situation because he, he considers the, the thing to be an irredeemable mess. And, you know, I can certainly understand where he's coming from. Anyway, this new deluxe edition also is going to be release, released without attribution. His name isn't on the box. Again, by virtue of all this copyright dispute, he's, he, he's been scrubbed from the narrative. And I've commented on this before. I, I object to designers being removed from the narrative. I think that if you're going to be working off somebody else's work, you need to credit them. Well, what I read was that he designed it with somebody else and they, they went off and they designed and they put out their own game and this other designer is going to have his name on this new box. It's very complicated. That right. is that is one piece of some of the claims All concerning right. the publication history of Age of Steam. But uh, <laughs> And I'll just plug in quickly yet another game that came out under the same vein at the same time, uh, Railways of the World, is having another – Portugal expansion that's coming out as well. So by Vital Lacerda, actually. yes, I know that's yeah, which seems like a strange departure for him. It's you know, Ra- Railways of the World is not really what I would identify to be within Vital Lacerda's wheelhouse. So I I, I I took note of that as well. On the reprint vein, Suburbia Collector's Edition was announced, and it's going to include all the expansions and the tiles are supposed to be super big. I have never played Suburbia. I have heard it is a fantastic game. So I'm looking forward to uh, picking up this collector's edition and giving it a try. The picture of the tower that holds all the tiles is very, very appealing. I encourage you to go check some some pictures out of the game trays central tile that they're going to use to to display the various uh, building tiles that you can purchase. It looks very, very neat. I have to say that same thing. Yeah, the, the Carcassonne had the same thing. They had a tower expansion that had a tower thing. And you, I agree with you. This The picture that they show of this super high-rise building where it distributes the tiles at the bottom, I think it looks really neat. I thought Suburbia was okay. I much prefer Castles of Mad King Ludwig. Uh, Suburbia has a number of usability problems, which I don't think there's much that they can do to resolve it. Uh, I've, I've ch- I did check the layout of the new edition, and it seems to have much of the same problems. It's just a little – it's a game where you don't do much in terms of decision-making, but in terms of focusing to make sure that you score everything correctly, it requires considerable attention to detail. Uh, and as a result, it didn't do a whole lot for me. But, yes, it does look like a lovely new re-edition. The only other thing I have news is because it's the beginning of the new year, we follow all these lists of people anticipating games and new games coming out and new games shooting up to the top of the hotness. And we have Wingspan and New Frontiers and Yawn. I watched, I read through the rules of both games today and watched lots, lots of people are liking them, but really birds are just doing nothing for me. <laughs> and, and the rules for New Frontiers is just so much like Roll for the Galaxy or, or, or the other one, they're so similar using all the same symbology, all the same art style, all the same sort of gameplay. I, I'm not understanding what they need yet another game for. I'm cautiously optimistic about New Frontiers because Puerto Rico, Roll for the Galaxy, and Race for the Galaxy, despite, as you say, sharing a number of superficial similarities, feel very, very, very different. And Tom Lehman has done some marvelous uh, design and development work over his career. So I'm very curious to see what New Frontiers does. I haven't bothered reading the rules for Wingspan. I don't really have much interest in what Stonemaier Games puts out lately, so I can't comment. So the last thing we want to talk about in terms of news, in all honesty, uh, over the course of the past year, we've received a, a bunch of listener requests for features that we've done our best to accommodate, and there's one that we haven't done until now. A number of people have asked us to start a Patreon for some way for people to support us. We're going to do that in the new year. We're thinking about different kind of pledge levels we're considering, and we're mentioning this in advance just to say if you have any feedback about things you'd like to see in a Patreon, things you wouldn't like to see in a Patreon, please let us know. We would appreciate your feedback a great deal so that we're able to offer something that, that you guys want. If it's the case that your only piece of feedback is don't, send us that as well. We'd, we'd like to hear what you have to think about what you would look in term, uh, terms of a Patreon, in terms of being able to support us. You know, long story short, I don't want to go into too much detail now because we don't want to waste your time about this stuff all the time. Yeah, nor are we going to be wasting your time every episode. We're not going to be slinging it every time. Nope. It's, we've already decided it's going to be like every five episodes. We'll remind you that we have it and it'll be very short and brief. Yes. Uh, but the the expenses are mounting as time goes on. So this isn't out of the blue and this isn't just to get free games or what have you. But uh, we're still going to do the podcast for free for pretty much ever. Uh, but as I say, people have requested information about how to support us. So we are looking at what we can do in terms of Patreon. So stay tuned for that in the coming weeks. And that is the news and why it doesn't matter. That's a very interesting segment. I'm glad we put that in there. It's a fabulous invention. We're very clever people. Oh, amazing. 
Feature game of the week, which is Pandemic Fall of Rome. Mark, are there any other pandemic games out there? <laughs> I Yeah, this, this comes out of nowhere, and uh, I really wonder how they could get away with just implying that all barbarians are diseased. It's terrible. It's, it's, it, look, I'm half Vandal, and I'm a quarter Ostrogoth on my mother's side. So this is, this is deeply insulting to me. So this was put out, well, last year now, because we're in the far future world of 2019, by Matt Leacock and Paolo Mori. Matt, Matt Leacock, of course, is Mr. Pandemic. He's had his hand in all the pandemics. And Paolo Mori is uh, one of our favorite designers here at Swag. He put out Dogs of War and Ethnos, two games that we both love a great deal. And this is part of the so-called Survivor Series, not to be confused with the WWE event. Do they still run that? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure they do. I shouldn't... Uh... Making a wrestling reference is, is definitely a mistake. I'm going to have the same problem that one time I talked about the Marvel Universe. This, yeah. the, anyway, moving on. Uh, the, survival, the Survival Series uh, so far consists of Pandemic Iberia, Pandemic Rising Tide, and now Pandemic Fall of Rome. So these are sort of historically or geographically situated uh, pandemic variations that are not necessarily about disease. You didn't mention Pandemic Monday Night Raw. <laughs> <clears throat> There's been another pandemic spinoff that was not in the survival series. There was Reign of Cthulhu. And this, of course, is not mentioning the incredibly famous pandemic legacy games of which there are now two seasons. Why don't you tell us what we do in Pandemic Fall of Rome, Walker? Well, in Pandemic Fall of Rome, the barbarians are attacking. And they're coming from all different directions. And you're rushing around the map trying to keep them at bay while trying to form alliances at the same time and making sure Rome doesn't get sacked. And it follows very much the normal pandemic layout, except, of course, now they're barbarians instead of disgusting diseases. So let's talk about the barbarians, because this, is this I think, is one of the really cool features about Pandemic Fall of Rome that hasn't really been done much in other pandemic versions. The first thing is, is that by now everyone's kind of familiar with the core gameplay of Pandemic, whereby you accumulate cards of a certain color and you ditch them all to either find a cure or to build something or do something in order to advance the victory conditions. But here, there are two things that are different. Number one, uh, the barbarians have different costs associated with them to form an alliance with them. So there's blue, which costs three cards, and there are comparatively fewer cards in the deck that are blue, uh, versus black and white, which each require five. And so that level of asymmetry I found really interesting and uh, really serve to differentiate things a fair bit. The different barbarians also have different number of cubes available, which further influences the victory conditions. And it also just gives different, uh, you know, a slightly different flavor to these different group of people. So rather than, you know, malaria versus typhus, you have the Ostrogoths versus the Vandals. And I thought that that was, that really uh, gave a little bit of variety to the standard formula. Yeah, and to give it more theme... Like every, not like everybody knows, but in Pandemic, you draw nine cards off the beginning. And in this particular game, which I don't think they've done in any other, any other issue before, is that the nine cards are set every time. They're just going to be different depending on how many cubes they're going to get each. And these barbarians follow a certain path around the map. And it's clearly marked, you know, blue path, orange path. And when you draw cards, you try to put them into the city that they say. And if they can't make it there, then you just follow the path. And they sort of dot their way around the map trying to get to Rome. Because if Rome gets sacked, then you lose the game. Now, what does this mean? And I feel it really changes how the epidemic, or in this game is called the revolt, how the revolt works. Because in Pandemic, the deck is seeded that you draw off of. And every so often, you're going to draw this card that, that you know, causes this huge centralized outbreaks of whatever on your map. And because the way that these barbarians, you know, f uh, progress along the map, that there's going to be, they're going to be dotted all over the place. And because you put three on, there is this huge chance that you're going to get an outbreak immediately when you draw this card. So you really need to play a little bit differently in this new version. What it does is it leads to a real sense of a geographical front. Because it is possible, especially if you're if you get the cards you need, to set up a fortified position right next to where the barbarians start and try to block their advance. Because there's this notion, as you say, of them snaking towards an ultimate destination, which is almost always Rome, but in a couple of exceptions, they're going elsewhere. And so they just – they spread in a very organic way, which is strange because in other versions of Pandemic, the cubes just kind of pop up 
everywhere. Whereas in Fall of Rome, they generally follow on a specific path. And there are, okay, there are, there are exceptions, of course, like the eponymous revolts where they do spring up these little pockets. But you end up with this combination of pockets and fronts, which really gives the game a unique sense of geography, I think. And it really did give the impression of being very, very different from the other pandemics. And that's something that I really appreciated. The other thing that's very much different is now that you have these legions that you have to bring around. In normal pandemic, you just go to an area that's causing a problem, you take an action, and it removes cubes. Here, you don't get to do that anymore. You have to tote around these legions that can only be summoned at forts. You can build forts like you would normally build other buildings and other games. And then there's this dice mechanism, right? So it sort of throws in this more random, like other pandemics is more puzzle-like. You know, this is, this is exactly what's going to happen. This is These are the cards that we need. But this throws a dice element, a little more randomness in it. You're not sure exactly if you're going to get rid of all the cubes that you need to or have the legionnaires that you want when you get there. I'm not 100% sold on adding randomness to the pandemic formula. I'll talk a little bit about this later when we compare it to Defenders of the Realm, to which Fall of Rome is, is superficially similar. But there are two serious virtues about the dice-based Legion combat system that I really enjoy. One of them is it adds to the character asymmetry. Each character has a special result on one of the die faces. And so you can have the military effectiveness range all the way from the Vestalis, who, being a Vestal Virgin and part of the priestly cast and doesn't really get out with Legions much, isn't super, super hot at command military forces. Unless, of course, you uh, get on a lucky streak and roll like I did last game, in which case the, uh, the, the Vessel Virgin is the Harbinger of Doom and kills everything everywhere she goes. All the way to more military-oriented characters whose special result is inflict waste upon your enemies. And so that, I think, really helped again with sort of identifying discrete roles for different characters to play, which gave a greater sense of ownership over what was going on. The other element of legions, which isn't strictly related to the dice that I really, really like, is you can leave legions behind, and they serve as a bulwark against barbarians showing up at various places. And there's basically a a further differentiation of that, because legions are more effective at blocking barbarian advance if they happen to be present where there's a fort or another character, which, again, really emphasizes the sense of geography in the context of of a front of a wave of oncoming barbarians where if you're able to set up choke points and really exploit their migration paths, you can really exert significant control over how the spread of cubes happens, which I have not found in previous versions of Pandemic. In previous versions of Pandemic, you're almost exclusively operating reactively. It's like, okay, there are three cubes over there. I got to go print about, oh, there's a cube now in Kinshasa. Let's run to Kinshasa and so forth. Now, there's a fair amount of forward planning involved in playing Pandemic, but you can't really predict where the next unseen card is going to come from once you've milled past that part of the deck, unlike Fall of Rome. Yeah, that's right. You can't set up a defense. You can't get it like a real strategy because sometimes you have no idea other than, you know, you can see how the deck is seating. But like you said, it's a it's a neat addition that you can, you know, strategize this defense, this sort of like tower defense. Like, okay, this is a choke point. I'm going to put a fort there. We're going to put up some legions. I'm going to go back to the special characters because not only do they have this, you know, special ability when you roll it on the die during combat, a lot of them have several other special abilities that make them completely unique. And they set up these power combos that you can do that are very, you know, unique to this particular game. It's like because when you make these alliances with the barbarians, it's like making the cure. In normal pandemic, you have to do that at a at a base, at a medical center. But here, you have to go out to where a barbarian of that color is. It's sort of like you know you're you have to find one of the barbarians and make an alliance with them. So one of the one of the cool power plays is like one of these guys can pull barbarians with him. So when it's his turn, he doesn't have the cards to make the alliance, but he can pull barbarians. So he takes this barbarian that's at the far side of the map and he runs it across the entire map to, to the guy that has the cards. And then on his turn, you know, he makes the alliance and makes up these really interesting combos that I have not seen in other pandemic games. I'd be inclined to disagree. I think that uh, – I, I agree with you that the combos exist in Fall of Rome, but I think that the, these great combos exist – in uh, all the good pandemic versions that I've enjoyed, you know, whether it's the ops specialist who's able to pop up uh, research labs everywhere that further helps uh, the the various characters that get to do lab actions in, in the lab, or whether it's so, the dispatch officer being able to move the medic around, sweeping an area clear of disease if they've already found the cure. Uh, I just think that this is more excellence in in the vein of things that we would expect from normal versions of Pandemic. So I'm, I, I guess I'm sorry that in previous versions of Pandemic you didn't get that kind of synergy, but I definitely think that this is not an exception. It's just very much par for the course. I just think it's more unique in this game than it is in other Pandemics. What I will give you in terms of of 
one of the one of the key virtues of Fall of Rome that I didn't really feel in the same way uh, that I got in Iberia or uh, or Rising Tide was that I really feel that so, the, the the new special action really helps to sell the theme historically. Now maybe this is just because I'm ignorant of Iberian history, or maybe because I'm ignorant of the the the, the various Dutch engineering marvels. But in Iberia and Rising Tide, basically the unique elements were uh, purifying water in the case of Iberia, which is, of course, very, very important in fighting the spread of disease, but didn't really sell me on the uniqueness of that area and, uh, you know, maintaining the dike systems in uh, Rising Tide. But in Fall of Rome, the unique element is after you've cut a deal with the barbarians, which, again, is kind of analogous to finding a cure for a disease, you can then enlist them to your cause. You can make them federate, which is extremely evocative of the way that historical Rome dealt with invading barbarians. You know, you buy them off, and then suddenly last week's pillager is next week's legion that is helping you fight off some other group of people that now want your blood. And as a result, the uh, Regina Federati, the, the, the character that you were talking about, who can, who was very, very good at dragging barbarians around, she was definitely my favorite character uh, because I love that action so much and she gets to do it more cheaply. And I think that the combination of the things we talked about before in terms of the sense of geography and the sense of setting a front and it feeling a lot more military in that sense and this element of Federati really helps sell the theme and makes it come alive in a way that I haven't felt in a lot of other pandemic games. Another quick difference between other pandemic games is that there's regions that have two different colors, which is a good and a bad thing. Sometimes it makes it easy to travel there, but sometimes there's one card for every area. And for those particular places that are double colored, there's two cards. So sometimes you can get into trouble if you get a bad draw. That actually leads to one of the elements that makes Fall of Rome surprisingly counterintuitive. I've had a great deal of difficulty with a number of different players on this issue, and I'm certainly sympathetic. And that is, there's a certain degree of confusion about the restrictions attached to various actions. Some actions require that you ditch a card matching your city. Some actions require that you ditch a card matching your region's color. Some actions require that you ditch a card matching your destination region's color, etc., etc. So the, this difference between caring about what's, what city the card says and what region the card says is an asymmetry that doesn't exist in the core version of, of Vanilla Pandemic. You care just about the color for the cure and for everything else you care about what city it says. Whereas Fall of Rome, it it, it's a little bit more nuanced, and it's a simple rule distinction. And I can explain the rule distinction in five seconds, but the problem is it still trips up new players, and even halfway or, or two-thirds of the way through the game. And so that's a, that makes things a little bit less intuitive than they need to be. Another thing about Fall of Rome that I don't think is super hot, especially as compared to other versions of Pandemic, is in this version of Pandemic, I feel that there are wasted actions or I don't know what to do with my leftover action more commonly. Because normally in, in base Pandemic, you look at the route you've traveled over the course of the turn and say, oh, OK, well, I've got a leftover action. I'll just remove a cube somewhere. But as you pointed out here, in order to deal with barbarians, you either need a card, which you might or may not have, or you need legions following, uh, following around with you. And you might not have those at the time you need them or legions to waste. So very frequently you have this sensation like, well, I know three actions to do the fourth. I'm not really sure. And that it's it's not so much tension as just a feeling of, of, of slackness, which maybe that's just because we're not good enough at the game. I don't know. But it, it definitely felt a little bit less uh, pleasant than other versions of Pandemic. Another thing that's just worth stressing because we're comparing Fall of Rome so much to other versions of Pandemic if you dislike co-op games in general or the Pandemic series in particular because of what's called quarterbacking or the alpha gamer problem, Fall of Rome will do nothing to alleviate these problems at all. So if you hate the normal versions for those reasons, Fall of Rome is not going to change your mind, not even remotely. But I will say, and this is, this is definitely something that's been true of the entirety of the survival series – there are these flourishes in the graphic design that I absolutely adore. The card backs are stunningly beautiful. Just these beautiful little designs that are very evocative of the theme, very colorful, very artistic looking. And they have rotational symmetry, which is great rotational symmetry, just meaning that, you know, no matter which way you rotate the card, it always the card back always looks the same. So you can't tell whether it's up or down, so you don't need to worry about the orientation when you're shuffling the cards. By the way, if there's ever another version of the resistance or any other hidden role game like that you need to have the cards have rotational symmetry i'm so sick and tired of games like this where <laughs> anyway <laughs> um but i really do think that it's a very very attractive production and they have uh, beautiful card backs i've really enjoyed fall of rome i think that it's uh, a solid entry to the pandemic well i was about to say to the pandemic legacy the only versions of pandemic that i haven't liked 
parenthetically, are ones that do away with the different colors of cubes. Any of the pandemic games where all the cubes are basically of one color, or all the threats are of one color, I find them very fragile, and I find them much more arbitrary and luck-based than these other ones, because your supply of available threat can vary wildly. So this is definitely true of, of Reign of Cthulhu. I thought it was uh, a, a very, very wonky. Rising Tide didn't do a whole lot for me. It was similarly only had one kind of cube. And Pandemic Legacy Season 2 also just had the one color of cube. Uh, I, I just prefer it where there's the different colors involved. You, have, you get to triage threats. You get to deal with the, the differentiation. And Fall of Rome, as I said, has yet further differentiation in terms of the different predominance of cards in the deck and the different number of cards that it takes to to cut a deal with the different barbarians. A small, another small difference with the cards is what they have almost in all pandemics are these action cards that you might draw instead of instead of uh, you know your normal territory cards, and these give you yet more special abilities that you do these you know outlandish things. But what this particular pandemic does is that you can take a hit, like uh, bring down one of your meters, another one to do like a, a extra special part of that card. So you can either use it the normal way, which does you know a semi good thing, or you know super thing. And take an extra hit. I thought that was a really interesting way to do things. It's another great trade-off. And finally, just to compare Fall of Rome to Defenders of the Realm. Defenders of the Realm was a co-op design released shortly after Pandemic. It was done by Richard Lanius of the original Arkham Horror fame. And uh, Defenders of the Realm, I really felt, if you really like Defenders of the Realm, I, I'm really not in a position to comment on whether or not you like Fall of Rome because Defenders of the Realm really felt to me like a variation by somebody who didn't quite like Pandemic to begin with. You know, I mean, for one thing, you can't trade cards in Defenders of the Realm, which is a very strange thing because a lot of what make pan, makes Pandemic tick is the cooperation between players and figuring out how to get the cards where you need them. So that's straight out of Defenders of the Realm. And I really feel like how Defenders of the Realm used dice rolling was just a little egregious. It, you know, brought the luck factor too high and led to frustration where you could prepare everything just perfectly and, you know, go to fight the boss, which is the equivalent of getting a cure, and, oh, you flood the die roll, so, uh, no, tough luck, too bad, so sad. Uh, whereas Fall of Rome's use of dice is very, very, very moderate in comparison. It's very gentle. Uh, and if you're if you're controlling a character who doesn't fight very well and or if you're afraid of the dice, as we've commented, you can set up defensive bulwarks, which are much more deterministic. So I think the Defenders of the Realm is... I, again, I can see the comparison because it's it's a game. Uh, they're both pandemic-like games where you have to roll dice. But Defender of the Realm is is kind of off the deep end as far as I'm concerned. So, in summary, I'm I'm a I'm I'm a pretty big fan of most of the pandemic games. I like the base game once you get an expansion into it because it gives you that character variety and that variety of events. But Fall of Rome, straight out of the box, very much like Pandemic Iberia, which is a really, really, really good pandemic variation. It's, it feels different in lots of good ways, but evocative and similar in lots of the same ways. And the differences are, are very historically evocative, and I really like the production. So it's definitely going to, uh, for me, I think it stands equal to the other uh, core pandemic games, and that is rather significant pra- praise. Yeah, I think the re- replayability is huge, right? Because there's like, what, eight different characters you can play? There's only four you're going to start with, and there's like tons of extras, so that's going to be different every time. And the action cards that I just talked about, you in a four-player game, you use six, but there's like ten more that you don't use, so that's going to change up the game every time. And I think it's fantastic. I, I've played it like eight times over the past week, and I love every play. It also scales a lot better than Pandemic. Out the box, it goes from one to five. The solo variant is surprisingly interesting. It has you control a single hand of cards and then a sideboard of other cards that you use doing the, doing, doing the trade mechanic and three different characters on the map. It, a lot of thought was put into it. It's very nice. Oh, neat. Also goes up to five, which normal Pandemic doesn't. Not so well. And it's a lot harder than normal Pandemic, I think. It, you know, it's got more revolts than, than base pandemic has epidemics and harder in a satisfying way. I really like the added difficulty. It, 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 it really gives uh, pandemic a shot in the arm. Well, I can't comment on that because I, I guess I'm weird and I enjoy losing co-op games. Weird, right? No, I, I enjoy losing co-op games. No, too. no, I, I'm not I, understanding. Other people have commented. That's all. Yes. I, I like the added difficulty. I think it's good. Yeah. The harder, the better, as far as I'm concerned. And you have lots of different – there's an additional challenge in Fall of Rome called Roma Caput Mundi where you're not allowed to bring any legions into Rome, which is, again, very historically evocative and also makes the game – we haven't tried it yet. I shudder to think of how one could win under those conditions, but it's doable. So, again, more historical flavor, more options. It's, it's a really, really solid package. Yeah, I'd give it a try for sure. And that is Pandemic Fall of Rome. So it's the new year. 
Let's uh, let's not get drunk because that's not really our bag. But let's let's consider what we've done over the past twelve months, the bodies we've buried, and what what's coming up for the new year. So let's let's start talking about th- resolutions we made last year and how well we've done on that score. Well, let's talk about one that we had on both our lists, which was helping the hobby grow more and being more welcoming and yeah. more patient, yeah, and and nicer to new people. Yeah, and I think I've been in pretty good in that. I've been starting new things. I even have a new Facebook group group called Mike Needs More Players, and it, it seems to be fairly successful. You know, I just say, you know, we're playing this then, and people sign up, and I still have all my different nights of the week where we play games, and and I uh, I'm trying to be more patient with newer players, and when people suggest playing a game I don't like, I I will still give it a try or or play and and not. Uh, you know, beat it to the ground while we're playing. Uh, I haven't been very good at this over the last year. <laughs> I'm going to have to try to, to redouble my efforts. In particular, last year I vowed to be more patient of interruptions during rules explanations. And here's why. I, just, just, to, just to explain, the reason why I get super defensive when people interrupt my rules explanations is because – I, I have a I have a, a an idea about how the idea about how the notions need to be organized, and furthermore, what I desperately hate one of the things that I hate most in, as a rules explainer because being a rules explainer is a thankless job is halfway through the game you remind someone of a rule or a restriction and they look at you and they say with recrimination you never told me that, and I absolutely told them that, and as a result when people when I have to remind people of rules, I often very, very aggressively remind them that I told them that. And I realize that people forget. I have to ask for clarifications all the time, too. You know, it's like, remind me for the third time how's the, how this thing works. I just, uh, I, I need to be less defensive. I need to be less aggressive. I need to be more tolerant of these things and not always imagine that someone's about to accuse me of having ruined their evening. All right. Next on my list was to research Kickstarter projects more before pledging. Yeah, how, you know, like, how, how's like, that worked like out? reading the rules or, you know, seeing, not at all, like <laughs> ridiculously not at all. But, you know, looking into this, I realized what it is. There is a scale in my brain. And if there is enough plastic to weigh the scale down, I pledge. Like, let's just look at the ones that I never read the rules. I have no idea how, to, how they play, but they're coming in the mail. There is hate. There is Reich busters. There is Scion Tempor. There is what else? All of these, I have no idea, just because they have huge amount of miniatures, I have I have sent for them in the mail, and it's going to be, I'm just hoping that they will all be at least playable several times once. <laughs> several times once? Several times once. Okay. Well, I, I also pledged to be a better playtester because I commented that I tended to sign up for to, to playtest games for designers, then I would never follow through. And that is one resolution that I kept. I've been a much better playtester in that I have volunteered or accepted requests precisely zero times to playtest anything over the past year. And let me tell you, it's been great. I was going to say, I, that's a huge effort. I have a 100% success record for every, every – I, I'm the best playtester in the world. I have failed zero times. Very nice. It's great. It's great. That's good. I have one here that said I was going to paint more miniatures. Yeah. I painted exactly zero miniatures, like not even shading, because I don't think we we revisited Gloomhaven again to shade new characters. So, yeah, that was a whole year of not picking up the paintbrush. Well, similarly, I I pledged to try to play more two-player games, especially tabletop minis games. And fortunately, we discovered Gaslands, which has let us do a lot of very – low barrier to entry tabletop minis gaming because it is a full-fledged tabletop minis rule system. So and, that's been great. And Shadespire. And Shadespire, which is not really a tabletop minis game in the same sense. But anyway, yeah, no, we, it's, it's definitely been good. I still want to play more two-player games, things like uh, Sacker Arms. I printed out a whole bunch of updated Sacker Arms cards for the new characters and to bring the old characters up to the new tournament standard in the, 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 the new Japanese editions. Haven't played any of that, and that is in part because you are such a killjoy when it comes to two-player games. So I'm I, very I, sorry. I just need to... I just need especially, to, especially two-player combat card games. Yeah. I'm very sorry. I need to make a second friend. That's what I need to do. There you go. Oof. That's, that, that'd be, maybe that would be a new... And one of the new resolutions. So my last one, we're just going to play the clip. Okay, play the clip. You were just downstairs and you probably saw the gaping holes because I bought another shelving unit. And even though I said I got to do my due diligence, those holes need to be filled. They're like holes in my heart. <laughs> if those holes aren't filled with, with games, these big gaping spaces in my shelf, then I'm not a whole person. So I'm going to be working on that as well. All right, so that is clearly someone... 
on bath salts. <laughs> it is sad, and I don't know who would say such a thing. And the very the the worst part is it, and the sad part is is that I have friends around me that allowed that to happen, that that let me purchase more and more games and fill these holes up for no reason other than to fill the holes up. It's terrible, and it sickens me that I have these types of friends. I would say that it's entirely your own fault. There is that one time that I kind of goaded you into pledging for more catacomb stuff. I knew what I was doing at the time. <laughs> it's very sad. And then I was, I was, I was tricked into getting who goes there. That no, that is not true. I was, I was <laughs> no, no, there. That wasn't by you. No, no, it was anyway. Yeah, that was someone else. Okay, yeah. okay, fine. That, was, that wasn't you. It was, the, it was he, he presented the theme and it sounded wonderful, and then. Look, yeah. you should know not to trust anyone's judgment but mine. It's, it's so true. Certainly not yours and certainly not some other rando. Is that, is that all of them? You're well, all that's, that's, that's all for – well, the, the only other thing from uh, last year that I pledged was to keep doing the podcast. So score. Hey. Well, so you're, wow. You're like three for three. Uh, no. <laughs> I haven't been a better evangelist for the hobby. I haven't been more tolerant of rules explanations. I've only been very technically been a better play tester. I was, I was trying to sugarcoat it for you there. Yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate that. But uh, let, let, let us wallow in our failures and, right. and speak truth to power. Let's move on to the ones that we're going to set ourselves up for failure for next year. Absolutely. Where are we here? All right. The first one is going to be more content for So Very Wrong About Games and more – quality content not necessarily you know what we're you know our podcast being better but the the audio quality <laughs> the, the audio quality being better and the way we present it being better not the actual substance itself just the just the audio quality and the website and the way we run the facebook and all of that i wish to get to a higher standard well, I'm, I'm look, very much looking forward to expand what we're doing. So you've, be, you've been doing some really, I think, past master avant-garde unboxing videos. They're definitely my favorite unboxing videos on the internet. And I think we can get into mo doing more video content in the future. Uh, we have the means. Uh, we even have kind of the interest. And there is the demand for it. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting back into that in the coming year. Uh, I don't know about... All that other stuff because half the, you know half of that statement seemed to be negging what we're already doing. The other half of the statement just seemed to be accepting that what. We, what no, no, we, I wanted I wanted to be clear that I was happy with what we were already doing. I don't want that. <laughs> I, I'm not saying that that quality has to increase. It's just the the actual audio quality I want to increase and and like I said, the website and the way we run other things. And on that thing, another one I have here is get back into video editing. Well, I look forward to uh, letting you get into video editing. I would like to double down on moving past uh, podcast-specific resolutions. I would like to double down and once again try to play more two-player games, more two-player card battling games. I have an appointment set up this week to play this Guilty Land with somebody that's the other Hollenspiel game that I talked about wanting to play. So that's a good start. I really want to try all the Sakura Arms stuff. And I know that there are some people locally that really like Sakura Arms. I just need to I, – I, what I need to do is I need to embrace my inner walker. And just be able to accept the fact that I can just start messaging people out of the blue and saying, hey, can you be my place in 20 minutes? And just going through a Rolodex because I really do envy your ability to, uh, you know, be a leader of people and, 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 and marshal people to your cause. And I, I need to do that for more two-player stuff. I also need to do that more often for what I would call event games. You know, like getting people together to play Mega Civilization, getting people together to play Triumph and Tragedy or Successors, like I thought it were Cataclysm, which is another thing that I got in recently that I'd like to try. Just, you know, accepting the idea that you can tell people, hey, do you want to spend five hours doing this weird thing next Saturday? And people will either show up or they won't. You know, very often you get some, some memorable experiences out of it. I was very surprised at our success at getting people from Mega Civ. I was, not a, I was not surprised at the success of the game. I was surprised at the success of get, marshalling all those people together. And so I should just uh, really try to build on those strengths and, and keep the new year full of, of lots of event-style gaming. Agreed. Next on my list is to get the grand game giveaway started. I've got all the games in a giant pile here, and I just need to motivate myself to uh, get them out the door to you guys. 
Yeah, some listeners on uh, on Reddit actually were talking about how they uh, they were wondering what had happened to that. So we really need to get our act together. I've got my list together of, of things I would be more than happy to send to our listeners at uh, no cost other than postage. So the really balls in your court just uh, – Yeah, once I get a little more things uh, straightened away here, we'll take a big picture of the big pile and uh, we'll uh, figure out a way to get those out. Yeah, figure it out. Figure it out. Well, the last thing that I'd like to pledge for the coming year is really – this is just really a function of my incredible failure of 2018. I I really stopped playing fun paperwork games in 2018. Uh, As you said, we've really let our Gloomhaven campaign kind of languish in the interim. And that is mostly because I couldn't deal with the the, the thought of the the additional mental overhead of, of the paperwork involved. Same thing with Kingdom Death Monster. So I'd like to pledge on air. That in the coming year, I would like to revitalize our Gloomhaven and Kingdom Death Monster campaigns, get back into that fun, fun paperwork, stop being afraid of the spreadsheet, whip out those pencils and erasers, with the caveat, of course, that the other people in the campaign need to start pulling their weight. I know. Those those, those awful, free, free riding, I lazy, know, it's terrible. I don't know. semi-literate jerks. I don't know why you play with them. It's, they're awful people. That, that's a good point. Huey uh, and Dewey. And if there's... The last thing on my list is a request from one of the listeners. He said, stop being bullied during podcasts. And that's another one that I'm definitely <laughs> going to try to live up for. I'm going to stop, you know, being bullied by my mean co-host. That can't be a request from a listener <laughs> because that sounds like something that you made up. Hey, and- my mom listens to every episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes one walker that does. There you go. <laughs> so those are the resolutions that we will fail to uphold in the coming year. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach Walker via his email, justrolledadice at gmail.com. You can reach me, Mark Bigney, on Twitter at the games you like. Just a reminder, we are soliciting feedback for what you would like and not like in an upcoming Patreon campaign, so please get back to us about that. We would appreciate a great deal. For more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page, or you can check out our Board Game Geek Guild, which is guild number 3236. We read everything you send us, and we will get back to you if we possibly can. Thanks again for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we've made some huge audio changes, so please give us some feedback on this episode about the audio quality as well. Thank you. You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bicking. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time, and always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>